Good evening, everybody. Welcome back to Exploring the Lord of the Rings. Finally, it has been a long time. We've had three weeks off now as I was on an extended road trip, which was successful. I successfully delivered uh, my child to college, so that was good. Um, uh, but uh, good to be back here with everybody. This is session number 197 of Exploring the Lord of the Rings. And today we're going to jump straight to the end. We're going to talk about the ending. That's what we're talking about today. Um, uh, bet you didn't expect that. But of course, there we are. Um, so, yeah, Bjarne Sonner, you are too right. North Dakota is just the flattest thing I have ever seen in my life. I've never, I've never even imagined anywhere as flat as that. It's unbelievable. Um, but um, uh, anyway, yeah. So <laughs> JJ says, I don't recall exactly where we were in the book. We'd better start over to make sure we didn't forget anything. <laughs> Agreed. <laughs> Agreed. Um, all right. So... Um, I want, well, well in, a, in a minute we will jump straight in. Let me uh, uh, remind you first, we are starting to approach. It is almost September. Tomorrow is September. And uh, then that is the month of our first regional moot of the year as we begin back our regional moot cycle. Um, so that is going to be the 25th, Saturday, the 25th of September, uh, New England moot in Durham, New Hampshire. You are welcome to join us either in Durham, New Hampshire for the on-site event, or you can join us online uh, for our digital version of the moot. Uh, we are working hard to accommodate both audiences and make sure that everybody who attends, whether they do so digitally or corporeally, has an awesome moot day. So uh, looking forward to that. Um, can't wait. It's fun to start right here in my backyard. So um, that's, um, that's going to be a lot of fun. I'll tell you some more about uh, the program and everything. We've been talking about the things that we're planning, which are going to be a lot of fun. So, uh, but I'll, 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 I'll tell you more about that next week. Um, anyway, yeah. So it's going to be it's going to be fun. Also, Middle Moot is coming up very soon after that, just two weeks after that, um, out in the middle of the country, um, out in Iowa, um, uh, in uh, Waterloo, Iowa, to be precise on October 9th uh, for Middle Moot. And once again, for all of our regional moots this year, um, we are going to uh, uh, be broadcasting them digitally as well. So, um, and yes, you can give a presentation at Middle Moot if you're only attending remotely. Yes, it is possible to do a remote presentation at Middle Moot. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, yep. Yep. That is definitely possible. That is definitely possible. Um, okay. <laughs> are rates allowed? Uh, yet, yeah, uh, uh, Amdiros, are you, uh, are you, are you trying to sort of circle it back again to the buttocks question? Um, uh, do you like it? <laughs> that we, that we attempted to address in several different ways a few weeks back? Um, uh, uh, no, no, rates are not permitted. Um, there will not be any, uh, any, presentations from the other side, as Gandalf would say. Um, uh, digital, yes. Corporeal, yes. Uh, incorporeal and ghostly, no. I, I mean, I think um, uh, for uh, like uh, health reasons, uh, primarily, we're going to have to uh, 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 say no to that, I think. Um, but um, <laughs> yeah, ro no robe, no boots, no service, says Tora Marthen. <laughs> That's exactly right. That's exactly right. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. So anyway, yeah, Emily, I'm sorry. I hope uh, I hope that uh, that doesn't uh, doesn't get in the you know, doesn't disturb too many people's plans for the moot. Uh, but uh, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> anyway, um, uh, yeah, so definitely um, 
uh, definitely, you know, uh, check us out, uh, signumuniversity.org slash events, and you can find the registration for both moots. Um, and uh, we are, we will be ready to go. Um, I do not yet have um, details um, for um, uh, other moots. We're still working on uh, f- uh confirming uh, the exact date uh, for Baymoot, um, but we're looking at the uh, early part of November uh, for Baymoot, probably out in Berkeley again at the same location, Berkeley, California, out of the same location that we did last time two years ago, though it feels longer than that. Um, uh, but um, yeah, so that will probably be in November. Um, and we are looking uh, at f- to do our first moot out in the Mountain West region, we're looking at uh, a Salt Lake City moot, um, uh, and I think we're we're talking about May, perhaps early May uh, for that. Um, I am um, sorely tempted to call that one Ute moot because I could, um, <laughs> but anyway, um, so. Uh, we we'll but anyway, yes, lots more, lots more uh, moots coming. Yes, trifle, great, excellent. Early May, that's what I thought. Yeah, exactly. See, uh, trifle, that's why it's so useful having uh, having somebody there on the ground um, to know about things like snow in the passes, so that we shouldn't schedule it too early in the year. I would not have known that. Um, but um, uh, <laughs> anyway, all right. So lots of fun coming up. Looking forward uh, to uh, uh, to the rest of this year. Um, but anyway, let us jump back into the text uh, so that we can remember where in the story we were. Somewhere in the first couple pages of the ring goes south when the ring has not yet quite gone south. And what we've been focusing on is how Gandalf and Bilbo have been working together to keep Frodo's spirits from going south um, because he has been struggling some with the reaction. Um which, to be fair to him, it's he just, you know, was proclaimed the ring bearer and volunteered to go on what looks like a more or less suicidal mission, uh, you know, just within the hour. So um, he's in a complicated emotional place right now. Um, so Frodo turns to Bilbo after Gandalf leaves. How long do you think I shall have here? said Frodo to Bilbo when Gandalf had gone. Oh, I don't know. I can't count days in Rivendell, said Bilbo. But quite long, I should think. We can have many a good talk. What about helping me with my book and making a start on the next? Have you thought of an ending? Yes, several, and all are dark and unpleasant, said Frodo. Oh, that won't do, said Bilbo. Books ought to have good endings. How would this do? And they all settle down and live together happily ever after. It will do well if it ever comes to that, said Frodo. Ah, said Sam, and where will they live? That's what I often wonder. Okay. Um, So remember, of course, there's a a delightful kind of callback to that moment at the end of the council when um, when Frodo is he has that brief moment of that brief surge of desire. Remember that we discussed uh, to stay in Rivendell. With Bilbo, and we were talking about the the source of that. Was that a, was it was it was that a ring temptation? The way that it kind of came upon him very suddenly sort of made it sound like a ring temptation. Um, but I was arguing at the time that I didn't think it sounded like that. I don't I think that's the way that the ring um, operates, in particular because the ring had always before tempted him to leave his friends, right, to abandon his friends um, and go off on his own. Um, So the ring tempting him to remain snugly in Rivendell uh, with Bilbo just doesn't sound like the ring's style, Um, not the kind of thing that the ring seems to tempt people to. And so therefore, um, if it's not the ring, that would seem to be Frodo's own heart, like his own like what he wants more than anything else, right? His idea of, you know, his brief sort of flash image of the positive alternative to um, uh, going off on a suicidal mission, right? Um, uh, So, um, and it is a very hobbitish desire, uh, Cook. I agree with you there. Um, And uh, yeah, hang on, guys. We'll talk about Sam in a little bit because Sam's comment is really interesting and I'm really looking forward to getting there. But um, we'll um, 
we'll we'll get there. We'll get there. Um, uh, yeah. So there's this, as I say, a little kind of callback to that. How long do you think I shall have here? Right. Gandalf had suggested that he does think he's already told Frodo to cheer up. Right. That he will be able to be here for a while. He's not being rushed out right away. Um, and uh, and so he asks, how long do you think I shall have? And Bilbo doesn't answer. Right. His non answer is really interesting. I don't know. I don't. And, and at first it's like you might think that he's saying, I don't know because I'm not sure exactly how long it's going to take the stout, the scouts to come back and everything. You know, it might be, you know, it might be only this long or it might be a little bit longer. We can't be really sure. But it turns out that's not at all what he says, what he's saying. Right. He says, I don't know because I can't count days in Rivendell. I have no idea. Right. It might be a short time. But who, who knows? Right. Um, but quite long, I should think. In some vague way, it will be long. We can have many a good talk. That's, I guess, how you measure things, right? Uh, you measure things, you measure time at Rivendell um, by good talks, right? Now, um, so let's talk about the time thing. What evidence do we have that time works differently in Rivendell. There are many who think this, right? Um, that there's this sort of timelessness about Rivendell. Um, we, a great deal of attention is paid to this in Lothlorien, right? Where they lose track of time and they're going to have this whole conversation about how um, they cannot believe that as much time passed there as they, you know, the evidence of the world around them suggests is actually true, right? Um, but, um, do we see, do we have reason to think that this, so I'm, so again, we, so we know this happened. We know there's this whole time issue there in Lothlorien. Is that true in Rivendell as well? I'm not a hundred percent convinced that it's the same actually. Um, and, um, it is true that it's often true in fairy, um, um, it is certainly, um, Bard, just as you say, a well-established thing um, that folks go into fairy and come out in a hundred years have passed, right? That kind of thing is definitely um, a very pronounced uh, thing. And so at the very least, I would agree that Bilbo's words kind of recall that in some sense, right? That having entered Rivendell, right? Having retired to Rivendell, which, of course, it's interesting when you think about it in the fairy context, right? Because on the one hand, retiring to Rivendell seems like the most obvious natural thing in the world, right? Um, I mean, what could be a more perfect retirement spot uh, than Rivendell? Um, and yet, at the same time, it's very strange. And I think it's important for us not to lose our grip on that, not to lose the way in which it is. It is still like crossing into fairy. Right. Um, and we get some we, we got some reminders of that with Bilbo. Right. And Bilbo and his interaction with the elves and things like he is, and his cheek. Right. Of making uh, uh, making, uh, make, you know, uh, writing lines about Arendelle and the House of Elrond and that kind of thing. Um, he is among the elves now. Right. He has sort of left the mortal world behind not really, right? He's still in the mortal world, right? Rivendell itself is in the mortal world. And yet again, there's that he's, um, his retirement is of a slightly more um, a pronounced kind, a dramatic kind. Um, most people don't go off to fairy when they retire, right? And again, Bilbo doesn't exactly either, right? Um, it's not it's like fairy, but it isn't fairy, right? The West is fairy. When you depart, when you take the straight road and you uh, you leave the circles of the world and you go to where time really does actually pass differently and all that kind of thing, um, it's um, that's fairy. Um, often the West is the real fairy. Um, 
These things are just the memories of it. Remember the conversation we had about the last homely house, right? Um, the last homely house east of the sea. It is like fairy. It recalls fairy for the sake of the fairies, right? For the sake of the elves uh, who are still east of the sea. Um, but um, uh, anyway, that's... Um, but it's not a place for mortals, right? And Rivendell isn't exactly a normal place for mortals either. Um, and so again, it's both very natural and also in that sense kind of unnatural. And we can see Bilbo's... Bil there is this sense in which Bilbo has um, left the world. Nancy says Bilbo is in training for the West uh, in some sense. Yes, in some sense. Um, um, and yeah, so I think that, um, um, I think that what we're seeing here is Bilbo's expression about his experience. Um, and now that doesn't answer the question to say like, oh, well, it's only Bilbo's perception that time is different here. Well, but that's kind of the point, right? Um, as, uh, one of you was just pointing out, um, for Dauntless, as you were just pointing out, um, uh, Aragorn is going to say in that later conversation, time doesn't actually stop anywhere. Um, not even uh, in Lothlorien. Um, but, um, uh, but yeah, it's... Um, so it's always, even in Lothlorien, it's a subjective experience. It's, it's a question of their subjective experience there. Um, so that hardly explains it. Um, but here's my thing. I don't think that's what Bilbo's talking about here. I don't think that Bilbo is trying to say the passage of time is just different here. Again, that's the experience they're going to have in Lothlorien, but I don't think that's what Bilbo's getting at here. When he says, I can't count days in Rivendell, I think he's talking about his relationship with it. His Again, he's left the mortal realm. How do you normally count days? Why do you normally count days, right? I mean, how, how does that work? Like, are there calendars in Rivendell? Do they keep track of that kind of thing? How do elves count days? And that seems to me really kind of the essential thing, right? Bilbo is a mortal living among elves almost entirely. I mean, Aragorn sometimes comes to visit here, and he used to live here when he was a kid. Um, but in general, mortals don't live here. Only elves live here. And so I think think there are a couple things going on here. One is, um, like, do elves count days? I don't think that elves count days. Why would they count days? Um, I mean, sometimes it seems like they can barely keep track of years. Um, and, um, and yes, Gilgalady, I think that that's a big part of it, that Bilbo lives in bliss and so isn't counting the days, just enjoying the existence. Yes, exactly. Um, Exactly. It's it's a place of rest, Cook. Uh, when we are resting and not working, we lose time. Yes. How does he measure time? He doesn't count days. Just uh, good talks, right? He keeps track of good talks. Um, there's a lot of time for good talks. That's, that's what his retirement in Rivendell is about. Um, but I think this is also really a callback to the beginning of Chapter 3 of The Hobbit. Well, Chapter 4, I mean. Um... Uh, when they're starting back on the road after their short rest in Rivendell, right? And there's that famous paragraph about, um, you know, it is a strange thing that days that are, the times that are good to have and days that are good to spend um, are um, not worth talking about, right? Are, are not much to talk about and soon over, right? Whereas things that are like dangerous, uncomfortable and palpitating, um, uh, you know, take, uh, uh, you know, may make a good story and take a deal of telling anyway. Right. That reference to um, that kind of memory of um, that passage in The Hobbit, I think, is what is kind of under Bilbo's words here. Right. Um, we were told that they passed some time. It's not clear exactly how much, you know, t like they, the time passed really quickly for them when they were at rest there in Rivendell, the very first time we ever met Rivendell in The Hobbit. And so Bilbo is still in that, 
like that he's still in that narrative place, which of course, remember he is theoretically the narrator of the Hobbit, right? So his own words about um, how little there is to say about, you know, times that are good to have and days that are good to spend. I think that that's what he's saying again, right? Even perhaps you might even take this as an allusion to his own book, right? To his own words as narrator. If we understand those, you know, Again, the book that we have, right, our copy of The Hobbit is a later uh, version of it, um, uh, mediated by, a, by a, a modern narrator. So, I mean, it's or at least a modern translator. So, you know, it's hard to say whether we have, like, the exact words of Bilbo there. But nevertheless, um, again, if we kind of think of The Hobbit as Bilbo's book, which I think we should be, as he is going to be segueing directly to talking about his book within this very same paragraph, right? And that's the other reason that I tend to go back to The Hobbit there um, at the beginning of this, rather than reading this in terms of him, Bilbo, that is, pointing to this sort of larger question about the flow of time uh, in Rivendell. I think he's talking about his own experience and alluding back to what he already said, um, uh, to what he said in The Hobbit. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. And Matt, I absolutely agree that, um, that, you know, immortals, um, would have a different relation to time. What is happening is the important thing. Um, not when, uh, because there's always enough time for something. And yes. And so that's, that's exactly what I'm, um, what I'm thinking about there. Um, that, um, he is, one of the things that he's kind of expressing here is that sense of being sort of swept up into an elvish view of time. Not just a view of time, but like of life, right? Of spending his life. Um, what matters is not the number of days, right? You don't count days if you're an elf because you have an almost inexhaustible supply of days. Um, uh, but you do keep track of how many good talks you've had. Right. Um, and, uh, and that's, that's what, that's why I think what, what I think is going on here. Um, so yeah, I mean, can we think about the preserving effect of, of Elrond's ring? It's possible. I mean, I would say this, I don't find anything in this that's inconsistent with that. So if you want to think about this as, you know, that, that there is an effect of, El I mean, is Elrond's ring having an effect on Rivendell? Yes, <laughs> it definitely is. Um, what I'm not convinced of myself is that it has the same effect or the same kind of effect um, that Galadriel's does in Lothlorien. Um, and we'll talk more about this a little bit later when we get there. Um, but there are other particular reasons why I don't think Elrond is doing the same things with his ring. I don't think the elf rings are automatic. Like, I don't, I don't think they're identical. I know they're not identical because Gandalf's ring is certainly not the same, right? And so, therefore, I have no reason to think uh, that uh, Vilya and Nenya are the same as each other, right? And have the same effects automatically. I think that the effects that they have have a lot to do, have some to do with the nature of the ring, um, but have even more to do with the will of the wielder and what they're attempting to do. And it seems to me that what Elrond is attempting to do in Rivendell is quite different than what Galadriel is tending to do, intending to do in Lothlorien. But we can't exactly compare and contrast those until we have Galadriel in hand uh, and we see more about her will and her intentions there. Um, so, um, anyway, that's, that's why it is, it is for those reasons that I myself do not believe that one of the effects that Elrond has created with the exertion of the power of his ring in Rivendell, I do not believe that one of those effects is that same kind of time bubble effect that Galadriel clearly has created, um, in Lothlorien. Um, and, uh, one of the reasons that I don't believe this is the way... Well, look at the role that Rivendell as a place 
is serving here. It's not only a refuge, right? That is, think about how they are desperately racing for Rivendell, right? Trying to, if they can just cross the border, right? By crossing the ford, um, then they'll be safe on the other side. And of course, Frodo is safe on the other side, even though he's only, you know, inches uh, on the other side of the boundary. Indeed, he does turn out to be safe, right? Um, so, uh, so that's that's one thing. It's a it's a, it's it's a place of refuge, but it's also a place of meeting, right? I mean, like look at all these folks who just showed up, right? It's not even just that he chose this place as the venue, uh, you know, for the get together that he was throwing. He says he didn't throw the get together, right? Everybody just came and showed up. Um, there's a way in which the borders of Riven, although Rivendell is a secret valley, right, and it's hidden, uh, you know, its location is not generally known, and yet um, its borders seem more open. Its uh, its 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 doors are open more. It is a meeting place. It is a place. Like even Denethor knows of Imladris and knows that it's a place that you can go to seek for lore, right? To seek for the answer of questions. Um, if they want some, if they want to find somebody in Middle Earth who can tell them the meaning um, of the dream riddle, then uh, uh, you know that's 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 where you go. He doesn't send them to Lothlorien, right? Uh, Denethor presumably knows about Galadriel's existence. I'd be a little surprised if he didn't. Um, there must be lore. Uh, in the in the lore of Minas Tirith about Galadriel's existence, right? And um, Alia Eru, that's exactly right. The last homely house is a place of hospitality. Absolutely, absolutely, um, a place of hospitality. Yes, yes. Um, it's um, again, it's not like a public inn, right? I mean, it's 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 still hidden. It's still secret. Um, it still is a magical valley. But um, but again, it's. Um, it has an outward focus, right? An open, like metaphorically sort of open doors, right? Figuratively open doors, if you see what I mean by that. Whereas Lothlorien is closed. Lothlorien is is sort of, um, it's it's just, it, it's it's not a crossroads, Lothlorien. Um, it's not a destination where people end up. Lots of times they get there, right? The the company will get there, but it's strange and unusual when they get there. Um, whereas, again, the only thing strange about everybody showing up for the Council of Elrond is that they've all showed up at the same time, right? With linked concerns who can all be benefited by having the uh, the Council together, right? Um, so, um, um, yeah, Rachel, you're absolutely right. Um uh, that she's reminding me that, of course, um, sometimes people do go to Lothlorien, um, but if they do, they often don't return. Um, and few return unscathed. That seems to be the, uh, uh, the lore in Gondor, right? Um, or at least we should hesitate there. Well, well, we'll, we'll get to that. We'll get to that before too long. But anyway, yes, there's clearly mixed, uh, um, uh, mixed sentiments there. Um, but, um, yeah, so this is again why I am very reluctant. I am, no, I'll go beyond that. I am unwilling to assume that things work the same in Rivendell and Lothlorien. The two places as places, as we see them, as they're presented in the story, um, as they're kind of understood and related to by the countries around them and by um, the, uh, you know, by places where lore is still retained of the Elder Days. Like it's, it's too different, right? They're too different from each other. Um, their whole purpose and focus seems to be quite different. And so, therefore, I cannot assume, just simply assume, that they work the same. Um, they might. They could. Um, you know, could Elrond do that? Yes. And again, do we see anything that is actively inconsistent with it, right? I don't think I could disprove it. I mean, if, if one of you were to draw a line in the sand and say, I am 100% convinced that Elrond, through the power of his ring, is changing the effect of the flow of time, 
Um, or even if you wanted to make the argument that that's one of the consequences of using one of the three rings in that way. Um, I don't think I could disprove it because there are many things that are said like this passage that are consistent with that, perfectly consistent with that. It just, it doesn't feel right. It doesn't seem to me to fit the larger pattern that we see in Lothlorien. And when I say it doesn't feel right, um, I'm not just trying to be like really squishy and evasive about that. That's what I mean by that. Um, what I'm talking about to kind of back up from it and use more proper English teacher language um, it's about the pattern. Um, it's about like my, my, uh, my inductive reasoning tells me no. Can't prove it, but it tells me no. It says to me coming like theorizing like this, trying to come to conclusions like this, it's all about finding a reading, finding an answer that fits, finding a key that fits the lock, right? You see all these things, you, you make all these observations and you pull all these observations together. And then what reading can you have that'll, that'll fit everything that you've seen as best as, you, as it possibly can? Right. And to me, that's just that key doesn't doesn't fit the law. It's not totally out there. Not at all. Not at all. And as they say, I don't uh, that's not a hill I'd want to die on. Um, and I don't think I could disprove it. Um, but I uh, I definitely I myself don't believe it doesn't seem to me, as I say, to fit with what we see of Rivendell as a whole. Um, instead. I think that Bilbo is alluding back to The Hobbit, which he's about to come back to, his book, right? Um, and he's pointing to the difference of his perspective. And by the way, remember what is on Bilbo's mind. What's the number one thing on Bilbo's mind? I think the number one thing on Bilbo's mind is Frodo and where in Frodo's own state of mind, right? And I think that he is, instead of answering the question, how long do you think I shall have here? There's no good answer to that, right? There's no good answer to that question. Not in the interest of cheering up Frodo. I mean, let's try out some answers. How long do you think I shall have here? Uh, about a week, week and a half, right? Well, that's depressing, right? I barely got here and I'm going to have to leave again right away, right? Um, okay, well, m maybe not. Um, month. It'll be about a month, Right. Any answer that he gives, no matter how long the time is, right, it almost invites Frodo to count down the days. Right. He doesn't want Frodo to count the days for him to count. The days is to focus on what comes next. Instead, he's inviting Frodo into this elvish perspective on his time here. I can't count days in Rivendell. You might almost paraphrase. Yeah, Eric, you were thinking of exactly the same thing. Right. That's just it. You could almost paraphrase that sentence as Frodo, don't count the days in Rivendell. You will probably have a lot of them. Let's just think about that time. Not the days, the time, right? The time that we have to spend together. That time should be quite long. And we can have many a good talk. There is a, there is a good season, a happy season, a restful season. And let's be there. Let's be here. Let's focus on this. Let us seize that time. Again, not those days. Let's not think of it as a time with this end period. Let's just focus on that. I don't think that he's just saying like, don't, um, uh, um, don't think of, uh, you know, like, the, you know, he's just telling him to just merely trying to distract him. I mean, there's an element of distraction here, but I think it's more than that. Um, uh, yeah, Admiral Malcontent, I agree. Um, uh, he says it's like a, a, on, a, on a smaller scale, but he says, think of the people who feel like their weekend is over as soon as Sunday starts and don't enjoy their whole weekend because of it. Yeah, exactly. Um, if you get too worried about the fact that you've got to go back to work or school the next day, then you don't enjoy Sunday, in which case you get what, one day? It's like 50% of your weekend lost worrying about the next day. Yeah. 
to some extent, I think that that's exactly the kind of wisdom that Bilbo is applying here to say, hey, um, I don't know um, how long you shall have. But here's what I do know. Quite long, and we can have many a good talk. And then he suggests he suggests a, a, a project, right? Um, uh, let's, we have time to do something together, right? How, what about helping me with my book and making a start on the next? And that, I think those are both really interesting suggestions. What about helping me with my book and making a start on the next? Helping me with my book, um, I've got to think that... I have two theories about what that might mean to Frodo. Frodo obviously knew all about Bilbo's book, right? He lived with him and, and, uh, uh, you know, talked to them. You know, Bilbo kept it secret in its its bragging rights for Mary that he once uh, got a glimpse of Bilbo's book, right? Bilbo was, was pretty secretive about that outside, but not to Frodo, right? Not to Frodo. Um... So there are two things, I think. One, it could be maybe Frodo helped him with his book a lot in the past, right? Maybe that was a thing that they did together. He often asked for um, Frodo's help in the older days, in the happy days, when they were still together in the Shire. And so him saying, what about helping me with my book, would be a delightful, exactly bard, a like old times feeling, right? Um, not just a nostalgia trip, but a reconnection. Not only a reconnection with him personally, but with, again, those days of peace and happiness. It's almost like he's sort of setting a tone, right? You're going to be here for a while. Don't worry about exactly how long. You're going to be here for a while. We can have many talks, so we'll, we'll, we will get time together almost as if Bilbo knows what was in Frodo's heart right before he volunteered, right? Um, And we can even kind of pick back up where we were before, right? The old relationship that we had, the old things we did together. Um, uh, The other theory is that if Frodo didn't help him, with his book before, right? Then it would be a new thing, right? Um, Again, Frodo undoubtedly knew about Bilbo's book and uh, and certainly read uh, Bilbo's book and had it read to him by Bilbo. Um, But maybe Bilbo didn't get Frodo's help actively. And so this gesture, helping me with my book, is a step to, like, a new level of intimacy. Exactly, uh, Bard, just what I was thinking. You've grown up, you're ready to help with this now. Um, uh, Yes, yes, exactly. Um, That would be kind of cool, too, right? And that one, either one, I think, would fit with the other half of the sentence and making a start on the next. Um, Let's think of this that is... Again, and this is one of the main reasons why I don't think his main purpose is merely to distract Frodo, right? Merely to stop Frodo thinking about the quest to come. Because, of course, he is talking about Frodo's quest, making a start on the next, the next book, your book, right? Um, help me finish my book so that, and let's start your book, right? Let's, let's do that transition thing. Let's, let's, during this time of peace that we will have together, let's do this rite of passage thing, right? Um, uh, And we can work on it together. Notice also how he's implicitly inviting Frodo to look at his quest with the ring, both his quest on the way to Rivendell and his quest hereafter, not as an ending, but as a beginning, right? It's a start of a new book. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, and yes, Admiral Malcontent, he does want Frodo to see that he's already, um, he's already accomplished impressive deeds worthy of putting down in writing. Yes. And you'll remember he said as much during the council, 
right? Remember when he says to Frodo, there were whole chapters of stuff before you got here, right? He's already expressed his desire to Frodo to get together um, to work on uh, to work on another book, right? To work on Frodo's uh, story. Um, and um, yes, yes. Now, Matt, you're right. Um, there is also more hope in it, too. You don't start a book you can't finish. It's a voicing of hope. No, Amdiro says, tell Tolkien that you can't start a book you don't finish. <sighs> True enough. But nevertheless, I agree. Um, if you know for a fact that there's no chance of your finishing it, uh, it's pointless to start it, right? Um, and of course, that's the, the kind of somewhat dangerous gambit that Bilbo makes at the end of the paragraph, right? Have you thought of an ending? I mean, not only does he not avoid the idea of Frodo's quest, he ac absolutely challenges him to think about the ending of his story, right? Um, you know, contemplate the end of your quest. Um, have you thought of an ending? As a question, that's really, really interesting. Um, musical, yeah, it does frame Frodo's quest in terms of his own. Um, yes, yes, um, kind of laying the two of them alongside each other, right? Um, uh, with my book and a start on the next. I also like the kind of ambiguity of the next, the next book, his next book, my book. The first is my book. The other one is the next book. He doesn't say my book and your book. He doesn't say my first book and my next book. It's kind of in between those two things, right? Um, and that seems to me to fit with the way in which he's inviting them to come into it together, right? Um, they're going to be co-authoring this next book, right? Frodo's book. Um, and again, he openly challenges him to think about the ending of his quest. Have you thought of an ending? Now, the other thing that's sort of more peculiar than that is the way that it's framed. It makes it sound like a work of fiction, doesn't it? Have you thought of an ending? I mean, like you might ask an author that who's writing a book, right? Have you thought of an ending? Do you know how it's going to end? How is Frodo supposed to answer that question? Have you thought of an ending? Right? I don't know how my story is going to end. But notice the kind of um, implied... Uh, um, the kind of implied uh, agency that he gives to Frodo there. As if he speaks, as if Frodo does, in fact, have the power to determine... The end of his story? Have you thought of an ending for your story? Because remember, he does. He does. Remember the emphasis that Elrond laid at the end of the council on Frodo's will. And that's still, I think, what Bilbo and Gandalf both are focused on in this scene, right? It matters less what Frodo may or may not be able to do. It matters a very great deal what Frodo chooses and where, what direction his will is pointed in. And so Bilbo here openly challenges him, invites him to think of an ending to his story. Because there is a sense, I think, in which Frodo can determine the end of his story. He can. Um, what I mean by that is he can decide how his story is going to end. Not what happens. Not what happens. He might not control that at all, right? Um, are they all going to die? Yeah. But guess what? They're all going to die anyway, sooner or later. That's not the question. The question is, how are they going to die? <laughs> right? How, what are they going to do? Um, what choice is Frodo going to make? 
where is his will set? As he sets out, before he sets out. Um, or to put it back into um, to put it back into Sam's language that we're not going to get for several years. Um, what kind of story is he going to be in? The events of the plot? Most of them, almost all of them, are not in his power, right? But what kind of story it is? Yeah, JJ, whether he's the hero or the villain, that's that's in his power. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In um, it's in um, uh, uh, in Gollum's power too, but later, later. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, Wolfie, I agree. It does help Frodo realize he's committed to something greater than he is. It challenges him to think about his own kind of um, attitude. Exactly, Drowsnake. What kind of story it is, is almost exclusively in Frodo's own power. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and yes, Captain Moe, it is Sam who is going to ask that question. Um, of Gollum, right? Hey, Gollum, do you want to be the hero or the, or the villain? Um, later. Later. <laughs> More later on this. Um, um, oh, boy, that's going to be a good month or two, isn't it? Ah, sorry. Just looking forward with uh, fond anticipation of the couple months we will spend talking about the the uh, um, the discussion on the stairs of Kira Thungol. Um Anyway, um, yes, yes. Ah, yes, Rachel, you're right. Uh, Gollum of, is, of course, not there to answer the question. But anyway, um, but we're not talking about that right now. But I do think that this is, this seems to me the kind of direction that Bilbo is very gently challenging Frodo, right? Have you thought of an ending? Yes, several and all are dark and unpleasant, said Frodo. Oh, that won't do, said Bilbo. Books ought to have good endings. How would this do? And they all settled down and lived happily and lived together happily ever after. Um, he emphasizes. <laughs> how would this do? I, I just sorry. I just I just always love that. How would this do? And then he comes out with this as if he's just like, hang on, hang on. I've got something. I've got an idea. It's a little out there, right? But here's, here's my idea. How about, and they all settled down and lived together happily ever after, as if no one had ever said that before, right? But of course, Bilbo knows full well. Again, notice what he's talking about, right? He's talking about what kind of story it is. Is it the kind of story that ends like that? that has that kind of ending, that has a good ending in that way. Um, dark and unpleasant, that'll never do. That'll never do. So in part, is he saying, uh, Frodo, don't dwell on the fact that you might die horribly. Eh, it might cross out, might put, probably will. Like, odds are you'll die horribly. I mean, like, come on. Like, from an Omdir perspective, there really does not seem like a very great chance of success here. Um, so again, it could sound like he's merely saying, no, 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 don't, um, don't think about the probable death. Um, think instead that maybe everything is going to be wonderful, right? Um, they all settle down and live, hap and live together happily ever after. It's going to be a happily ever after story, right? Let's just think that yours might be a happily ever after story. Um, but, um, yeah, yeah. Um, interesting. Matt says Bilbo is turning this into a writing room. An appropriate thing, given that everyone here will be an author of an important work of Hobbit literature. It's true. Yes, you have uh, you have uh, uh, several uh, future giants of uh, the of, of of Hobbit literary history right here in the room. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, uh <laughs> yeah, draw snake. I agree. They need to get Findigil in the room, right? Uh, absolutely. Um, uh, <laughs> Bjarna Sonner says, apparently Tolkien, being a writer, doesn't know how to write non-writers. Yeah. Well, Pippin doesn't exactly write, but um, but he collects, right? He's uh, he's still a great patron of literature. Um, uh, yeah. Well, 
Okay. So, I agree with the important distinction between, he doesn't say books ought to have happy endings. He says books ought to have good endings. And I agree that that's an important thing. Now, his good ending example that he gives is a happily ever after one, right? And again, I, I, I don't want to get away from the fact that I do think on, on one level, right? He is definitely saying to Frodo, make sure you keep your mind open to the fact that you might live, right? This is not, this is not a suicide mission. Um, Elrond, Gandalf, they wouldn't have sent you if there was no hope, if there was no chance at all. Um, there is chance of success and even of survival. Um, so don't just, um, don't give in to, um, you know, do not allow your will to become focused on the notion that you are moving towards a dark and unpleasant end because that is the thing that is most calculated to turn him towards a dark and unpleasant end. Um, we will have opportunities later to see that despair. Um, despair is uh, a big deal, right? Um, when you abandon hope, when you abandon both Estelle and Amdir, um, it, um, it doesn't go well. It doesn't go well. And I, but I agree. Good endings are not necessarily the same as bad endings. Um, Hathalas, does uh, good ending inspire hope? Um, uh, yes, I think, perhaps. Perhaps it does. Um, and uh, I do agree, JJ, also, that um, uh, good is highly dependent on one's point of view. Uh, that's true. That's true. Um you can look at, um, um, I mean, yeah, uh, JJ, you're talking about uh, Theoden's end, right? Which is a really interesting example, right? JJ, just think of uh, think of Eowyn's words about that, right? When she hears of Theoden's death, right? That is grievous, um, but it is good news beyond anything that we hoped for in the dark days, right? I mean, she she can see both sides immediately, right? Um, but. Um, uh, but yes, a good ending doesn't necessarily mean a happy ending. And of course, we're going to get that even at the very end of this book in a different way, right? Gandalf is going to say, I shall not say, do not weep, for not all tears are an evil, right? Um, not all endings are happy endings but they can still be good endings. Um, so, <laughs> spoilers. <laughs> True, spoilers. Um, um, yeah, yeah, so, uh, agreed. There's a wide difference between good ending and a happy ending, and it's a good ending that Bilbo insists upon, and that seems to me very important, that he is insisting upon that with Frodo here, right? Um, don't turn yourself towards dark and unpleasant ends. Do not... You are writing your own story. You can't control everything that happens, right? You can't control the whole plot, but you can determine your own story and what kind of story you are in. Don't let it be a dark and unpleasant one. Because that's not going to be a good ending. It's not going to be a happy ending, but it's not going to be a good ending either, right? Um, there is clearly such a thing as a bad ending, um, as well as... a. Uh, as well as a good ending. Um, and so he comes out with the happily ever after suggestion. Right? Here's this as a, a radical alternative to uh, the dark and unpleasant one. Right? What do you think of this? It will do well if it ever comes to that, said Frodo. I'm not 100% sure how to read Frodo's response there. Um, skeptical. One could read it skeptically, right? Oh, it will do well if it ever comes to that, 
right? One could read it like that. Um, is he beginning to turn Frodo around, right? Is Frodo picking up what he's putting down at all? Maybe, maybe. Um, um, it will do well if it ever comes to that. Um, he, the if does not merely reject it, right? He's not scoffing at the happily ever after ending, right? If it comes down, of course, he's not uh, just buying into it, right? Being like, yeah, you're right. We probably will live happily ever after, right? I mean, that's obviously not his attitude there. Um, I like to think that he's acknowledging the good ending, right? Um, if it ever comes to that, it will do well, right? I don't think that he's... Um, um, again, I don't think that he's instantly turned around, um, but it does sound like he's at least, you know, the if also does suggest the possibility, right? That there is, uh, that there is, uh, um, that there is hope. Um, Admiral Malcontent, though, I could buy that reading also, that he's maybe unconvinced, but doesn't want outright to say he doesn't believe Bilbo, um, Yes, yes. Um, Nathan, yeah, I mean, thinking about the Morgul wound um, as uh, and what role it has to play in Frodo's outlook here. And now again, like, like it doesn't mean much, right? I mean, <laughs> he's just like, yeah, like, okay, so this ring is like spiritually uh, radioactive. It's uh, prohibitively likely to bring its, you know, its bearer to his destruction. Um, Sauron, who is so powerful that all of the armies of the good guys combined can't fight against him realistically. Um, I'm going to take this radioactive thing and I'm going to walk with probably not much backup um, into Mordor, you know, on my own, like whatever. I mean, look, there's not much reason for Amdir here, right? Um, again, I don't think you, even if you're not at all either physically or spiritually scarred by any recent experience, you might feel a little glum at this moment, right? I mean, he made the call. He made the choice. He walked into this with open eyes, and he volunteered. Um, but, again, I think it'd be pretty easy. Um, it'd be pretty easy to uh, be feeling pretty down about this thing. Um, uh, yeah, I wonder. Matt, that's a really good theory. Um, Matt says, I usually hear people say, if it comes to that, when speaking of a bad thing, um, so is, uh, is Bilbo, in, is uh, Frodo rather engaging in a little hobbitry here? Um, kind of turning it around to being like, well, if it comes to that, right? Um, is he teasing Bilbo in some ways? It will do well if it ever comes to that. Um, yeah, because you're right. Um, if it comes to that, normally is said about a, uh, um, a bad thing coming. Um, yeah, I agree. Um, it will do well if it ever comes to that. Um, yeah, right. So it, it would be uh, kind of like, I mean, not quite like being fully sarcastic about it, Matt, right? But, you know, something like, well, you know, I guess in the worst case scenario, right? Like that, that kind of teasing uh, of Bilbo. Um, yeah, maybe, maybe. I don't think that Frodo... Frodo does not seem to me depressed in this scene. I think that's going too far. Um, there is doubt. Not just his own doubt. I mean, there's doubt about his state of mind. Gandalf and Bilbo are in doubt about his frame of mind. He's like, he could go either way. He could spiral down into depression, 
from where he is, but I don't think he's there yet. I think that's why both Gandalf and Bilbo have been intervening here. Um, uh, yeah. Um, so I don't think that we need to read him as like already completely glum and they're trying to pull him out of it completely. I, again, I think that Bilbo perceives that he, um, you know, Frodo's will stands on the edge of a knife here, right? Um, and could go either way. Um, yeah. Uh, now, Kokovutin, uh, Kokovutin major, uh, minor, that's really interesting. Um, uh, I don't know. Maybe. Uh, Cook is saying that he's read this as a, uh, a bit of clear-sighted foreseeing by Frodo. Um, he is going to fail. He is not going to have a happy ending. I think... Yeah, hang on a second. Let me come back to that in a second. Bard, you're exactly right. That's exactly why I don't think it's safe to read... Frodo here as already depressed because as you say, depression involves a level of paralysis. It's certainly associated with this sort of state of paralysis, right? And he is he is moving forward. He has made the decision to move forward. He's going to continue moving forward. Um, I agree. He's not depressed. He's anxious. Yes. Um, but anyway, Cook, back to your, back to your point. Um, I think I disagree or I guess I'd say more gently, I don't see enough evidence to conclude that he is foreseeing his own failure. But we do have evidence to think that what foresight he has tells him this is not going to be a happily ever after story. Um, remember, he had that foreboding from chapter two of book one, right? Right. Now, in part, he was expressing his own anxiety, his own, um, uh, you know, it was it was a it was a slightly pessimistic expression, right, for him to say, "This will be no there and back again journey," right? I go into danger, um, I go from danger into danger, drawing it after me, right? So he was, um, uh, to some extent, that was just a a. Uh, um, anxious and um, pessimistic assessment of uh, his, um, you know, where he was going to be. It's not going to be like Bilbo's story. But again, I think that on other occasions, we have seen him have that. There's been the parallel with Bilbo. And yet, I think his instinct, right? I go to lose a treasure, not to gain one. He is going from Bag End, and he's going to seek a mountain, a lonely mountain even, right? Uh, you know, with the treasure. I mean, there are all kinds of parallels. Some are parallels and some are anti-parallels though, right? And again, he's perceived that from the beginning. Is his journey like Bilbo's? Yes, in some ways. And we've seen from that same moment, right, while he's saying pessimistic things, Nevertheless, his heart is rising at the thought, you know, there's that moment when he could almost have run out the door without his hat like Bilbo had done way back then, right? So there is an uprising in his heart, um, you know, an upsurge to want to follow Bilbo, right? This, this, this hope, this Amdir, that maybe it will be like Bilbo's journey. Maybe we'll finish the one book and then we'll write another book which will be just like it, right? Um, full of hairbreadth escapes and... Um, and not without sadness, but um, but in the end, it had a good ending, right? It had a good ending in every way, both a good and a happy ending. Um, but I agree, Cook, I don't think from the beginning he's really believed that. I think that he has seen, if there's one thing that I think he has foreseen and foreseen clearly... This is no treasure hunt. This is not that kind of story. It's not going to be the same. Um, 
if he has a foresight, that I think is where his foresight is. And so does he attach to that? Does he have the foresight that whatever happens, he is not going to settle down and live together happily ever after? Right? Um, we know that at the end, that's kind of where he's going to be, right? He tried to save the Shire, and it has been saved, but not for me, is where he's going to be at the end of the story, as we get it here. Um, now, of course, I still think that Bilbo's going to have the last laugh, right? Because although the book ends not with them settling down and living together happily ever after, that's not going to happen for Frodo in the Shire. Not in this book, right? But if you think about his story, the story of his life, settling down with Bilbo and living together happily ever after is exactly what they're going to do. Not in Rivendell. Better. Right? Um, so I think in the end, Bilbo's going to have the last laugh. And Bilbo's ending is exactly what's going to happen. Um, Bilbo has precisely called the ending of Frodo's story. Um, even if Frodo doesn't think it. And even if, in a sense, Frodo doesn't even know it or feel it later on. Um, but... Um, yeah, even Elrond and Goadriel will be there. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. Anyway, um, well, let's get to Sam. What do you make of Sam's interjection? Ah, said Sam. And where will they live? That's what I often wonder. Now, especially having just been reflecting on, you know, the voyage to Elven Home and such, um, it's really fun to imagine this as a kind of foreshadowing of that. Right. But I want to start with what does Sam mean, right? What does <laughs> Sam eyeing up Rivendell real estate? Yeah, something like that. Uh, they gave up Bag End. Yes, yes. Um, good. Er, that's 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 a really important thing. That's a really important thing. Um, it's easy to see Sam as kind of a wet blanket here, right? Um, how would this do? And they all live down, live, settle down, and live together happily ever after. It would do well if it ever comes to that. And where will they live? That's what I often wonder. Sounds a little puddle glumish, doesn't it? There at the end, right? Like, uh, I mean, doesn't he sound like a bit of a wet blanket, uh, Sam, in that moment, right? And yet I think that you're extremely right to point out um, that uh, Aird, uh, Aird 84, as you said, he is assuming they're going to live, right? Even to worry about like, well, Bag End's been sold and Bagshot Row won't be the same, and uh, and uh, you know, we'll have to, we'd have to find a house somewhere else, and who knows where and what's going to come of my gaffer? And I, yeah, okay, that's kind of, and I'm sorry to like make keep making Chronicles of Narnia references, but like. It, it, um, Puddleglum is pretty much the ideal embodiment of that kind of attitude. I mean, it, he is Puddleglum is one of the great archetypes in my, in my mind. Like not just like a literary archetype, but like a uh, like a personality archetype. I mean, um, Puddleglum is, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, um, and I like him better. Yeah, him and Eeyore, I agree. Um, but, um, but of course, Puddleglum is even cooler, 
I mean, Eeyore is cool. Don't get me wrong. But um, uh, uh, anyway, anyway. Um, but yes, don't miss the fact that Sam's own kind of gloomy questions about the future are premised upon their survival, right? I mean, you know, if only they should be so fortunate as to return to Bag End and then have to figure out what to do with property sales and 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 real estate questions and um and where's the gaffer gonna uh you know grow his potatoes and stuff like that. Um uh, yeah, yeah. Um Yes. Um, Cook says, I think Sam is really embracing the hope of a happy ending. Um, he's a gardener, and his idea of a happy ending is to, is to get down to the business of making yourself a home, growing things, thinking about weather and seasons and neighbors and such things. Wondering where they're going to live is his happy ending. Um, yeah, I can hear that. I can I can see that. Again, he, he is. He is... Heartily embracing the, I, again, all of that is premised on we're not going to die in a ditch halfway to Mordor, right? Um, uh, no question. Um, but, um, uh, yeah, yeah. And I don't think it is true that Frodo sold back end. I don't think that this is a reproach to Frodo. Um, But I, so I guess my question is, um, my question is, what is his frame of mind? I don't think he's expressing hope. I agree that his comments are founded upon hope. It's like hope is taken for granted. Like the return is taken for granted. The, uh, the doubtful and, and gloomy questions about the future are premised upon the success of their journey and their personal survival, right? Um, notice even the they, right? Like, they're all going to survive, right? But then, where will they live, right? Um, and I agree that he's practical. Um, I agree that he's practical, but... But, like, what's his... Why does he say it? Why does he say this? Um, what is, and, and again, what's, and, and I, I, I do agree. Some, one of you was saying before, um, that, uh, the, ah, is a very expressive thing. And I agree, but what I'm not sure of is what it expresses. Um, Hathalas, I could hear that. I, I see what you mean, um, that his comment is like he's not reading the room and he's kind of out of touch with what's going on here. But here's the other thing that I would say. Um, he's going on the quest too. Uh, that is to say, and it, it's not only... Um, he's the only other person in the room who is in the same, similar anyway, position to Frodo. Bilbo is in the position of one who is in Rivendell and going to stay there, trying to help to manage the will and emotional state of Frodo, who's going to go out on the quest. Sam's going on the quest, too, right? I don't think that Sam stands on the edge of a knife in quite the same way that Frodo does about where his will is going and what his will is oriented on. Um, but... Um, uh, if one were to say to Sam here, dude, Sam, we're trying to cheer up Frodo here. What are you doing? Sam might well respond to you by saying, and what, what about me, <laughs> right? I'm going off on this journey too. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, exactly. Frodo is going on alone with his servant. That's exactly right. Um, yeah, um,
Is it just... Here's one of the main things that, thinking about the big picture, and I'm doing lots of remembering ahead tonight. Um, but um, one of the things I am going to be... Mo- I, here's what... This is on my short list. I've got a lot of things I'm looking forward to in the remnant of exploring the Lord of the Rings with you guys. But here, this is on my short list. On my short list is being able to do a careful and longitudinal study of Sam's relationship with hope. Because I have never been fully satisfied with anyone's treatment of Sam's relationship with hope in The Two Towers and The Return of the King. It's very complicated. And um, I am... uh, I think this is a really interesting early data point on that question. Um, And again, it's complicated, right? As we said, it's premised on hope. There is a kind of Amdir and Estelle underlying this statement. And yet, or is this Amdir with a lack of Estelle? If he's saying that he wonders where they will live, like, one way to read this is you could read this as a complete downer, right? A complete downer, right? Like, yeah, well, even if we do all come back and live happily ever after, where will we live? We don't even have a house anymore, right? You know, Lotho Sackville Baggins has probably turned us out of Bagshot Row already, and so, you know... Even if everything turns out beautifully and they all settle down and live happily ever after, they won't have a place to live, right? I mean, you could read it like that. Like, completely... um, uh, Completely Eeyore all the way through, Cook. Exactly. I I don't believe it. I don't read it that way. I don't don't think that that's true. Um, Yeah, there's still Crick Hollow. Though, music guy, I doubt he's forgotten that, Sam, right? And so, um, I know Sam's forgotten that. So, uh, he seems to not accept that as a viable option. Um, uh, you're right, Crick Hollow is in need of some minor repairs. And it's true, we can't assume that Crick Hollow still stands, right? Last they knew, the Nazco were going to be... <laughs> We're going to be uh, honing in on it. So, uh, um, uh, yeah, yeah. And I agree, JJ. Crick Hollow is pretty far from Rosie. Um, I mean, yeah, yeah. Like okay, it might, um, it might, it might as well be the moon, right? From a Hobbiton standpoint. Um, but, um, yeah, I, uh, I I agree with people who are saying he is focused on practical forward planning. We will see that again and again. Yes. What I want to know, though, um, is what... Um, what I, what I want to know is what that tells us, though. By the way, here's a little rule of mine. Well, more of a guideline. Um, I try never to use the word realist. Mostly because I find the word realist or realism almost perfectly useless as a word. Um, whenever you hear someone in in an argument say, well, I'm a realist, they're saying nothing. They've accomplished nothing at all. Never say that in an argument. 
Because everyone, it's the question is, what do you think reality is? That's the question. Everybody thinks they're a realist. The question, every, it's the question is, what is reality, right? Um, uh, I mean, uh, there's, there's, everybody believes themselves to be in touch with reality. Everybody does. I think almost everybody does. Um, but, uh, um, but yeah, so if you say somebody is a realist, um, I don't know, sometimes I think when people say that, they're saying, I agree with that person <laughs> because I like to think of myself as a realist. Anyway, um, uh, I, um, yeah, so I, I don't find that a useful word at all um, uh, because, again, the question is, what does that person think reality is? Or to put it back into Sam's terms from later, what kind of story do you think you're in, right? Um, or to put it back into the way that I think Bilbo is trying to frame it earlier on with have you thought of an ending, what kind of story are you setting out to be in? Are you setting out to write? <clears throat> you're going to write your autobiography, right? What kind of story is it going to be? Have you thought of an ending, right? And that is a wonderful thing to think, isn't it? Um, have you thought of an ending to your autobiography yet? A uh, fascinating question. Um, yeah, but anyway. Um, <clears throat> uh, yeah. Um, okay. Okay. Um, Matt says, does Sam in this statement even assume he will have a, a voice in the choice of where they will live? Um, that's going to be Mr. Frodo's decision, not his. Mary and Pippin have their homes to return to. Um, yes. Yes. Um, yes. <laughs> Pard, that's a good thought. Um, the have you thought of an ending to your autobiography yet made me think of two side-by-side -side graves marked Baron and Luthien. Um Yeah. It's a good story. It's a good story. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, yes, I agree Arnaz Realist is very often used as a defense against accusations of being a pessimist. Very often by people who don't want to admit that they're pessimists. Um, but again, it doesn't matter. And the same the other way around. Um, uh, but anyway... Um, Anyway, I just wanted to just wanted to to, to mention that I that I don't find that a very useful word, honestly. Like it's a word that seems to me to have been almost emptied of meaning. Um, but um, anyway, okay. <laughs> I find it vestigial. Right now, uh, Lupita, magical realism, quite different. That's that, that's okay. <laughs> I have no problem with that. Uh, absolutely. Um, it's time to end. But I'm not. Sh I don't feel satisfied. I don't feel satisfied that I really understand Sam's mind here, and I want to understand Sam's mind. It's okay, I guess, if I don't understand it completely, because we still have a long way to go. And, you know, a lot of observations to make in order to put together the full pattern of Sam's mind. So maybe we don't have enough data really to draw a firm conclusion yet. Perhaps I should satisfy myself with the observations. I think that's what I'm going to have to do. We'll have to come back to Sam. So we're going to put a big old watch on this. Watch... Sam's, especially Sam's, Sam is such an, uh, an add-on commenter, right? You know, um, we often get his remarks about things. He's going to be like the one man Statler in Waldorf at various points, uh, in this, um, uh, in this journey. Um, but, um, yeah. What do we read there? What is the pattern there? We'll see if we can draw some firmer conclusions as we move forward, and we'll remember this line. 
Um, that's what I often wonder. Um, yeah. Anyway, we'll return to this. Maybe next week. Maybe not next week. Um, uh, we're going to. Uh, we're gonna. We're gonna. We're gonna. We're gonna keep moving forward. Anyway, but I should stop. It is getting late. Uh, thank you, everybody, uh, for joining me again today. Um, it has uh, been a lot of fun. So good to be back. It's always hard to be gone for two whole weeks in a row. Um, I uh, start going through withdrawal. So uh, great to get back into the text uh, and discuss with you guys again. Um, yeah, we totally did a one slide. Absolutely. One slide was a good day. One slide is a good day. Come on. One slide is a good day. This is a, what, this is a six paragraph slide for crying out loud. I mean, yikes. Um, uh, anyway. All right. <laughs> exactly. A full slide. That's exactly it. Um, yeah. Cool. All right. Thanks, everybody. It's time for a field trip, so stick around if you want to join us for our field trip. Uh, if not, thanks for joining us, and I will see everybody next week. All right. So, unfortunately... Good hey, good evening, Druid's Fire. Unfortunately, Valori can't be with us tonight. Um, so, Druid's Fire is going to join us here. Hang on a second. I'm having you poor fool. issues. <laughs> Okay, there we go. Just caught it. All right. All right. So I'm um, trying to remember where in Middle Earth we were. Oh, yeah. We're still, we didn't make it to the next, um, no, we did not make it to no, the next milestone. So that's, if I'm, I'm just going to go to the map for a second. Go into the map to remind myself. Never mind. Let's just travel and then I'll go to the map. Okay, so we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna um, we're gonna stable master it from South Bree, right? Yes, indeed, to Anak Kurfu. Yes, yes, to Anak Kurfu up there in the Wells of Lang Flood, uh, right? Wells of Lang Flood? Yes. No. Yes. No, it's in Elder Slade. I'm sorry. Elder Slade, right? Yeah, because we finished with the Wells of Lang Flood. Um, Okay. So. All right. So we're going to head off. So, uh, uh, so yes, Kiesa, right? Kiresa here. Mm -hmm. Kiresa is the one that you should uh, send a tell to to get invited into the raid here to join us on our explorations. And uh, yeah, we're not going to explore Anak Kurfu, but we're going to travel to there. It's a still our travel point. We do have a lot of low levels with us this evening. Oh, well, that'll be fun. They'll be very dead. Well,. That's, yes, uh, it might be posthumous fun, but it will be fun one way or the other. Uh, so yeah, Kiresa, K-Y-R-E-S-S-A is the name. All right. And... Uh, I think we have everybody. All right. So yes, traveling overland in uh, Elder Slade, which is a level 130 region. Mm -hmm. There is a so, version for level 20. It does scale, but the, the place we're going to will be very unfriendly. Yes. We'll join you anon, because I was adding people to the raid. Yes, you'll be okay, briefly. But we are going to go overland today, because... I, if I'm remembering correctly, my goal is to hit the next uh, milestone. Mm -hmm. More dwarfs. Places above the ground, strangely enough. Yes, yes. We're going to have a look at that after uh, coming up with some theories last time. Let's see where... Oh, I, I had scrolled down. So I should have left it up there. Because where is it? There it is. Zanach Kurfu. It's part of the uh, attempts by Standing Stone to let lower level players uh, experience end game story, you know, 14 years after the game launched and whatnot. So, right. Um, and it's basically set for level 20 on up and it does scale. It's a story Parshans do. So, this area is level 20? 
It can be. Uh, the story portion of the War of Three Peaks uh, will scale based on the person going there. Okay. So if you're coming here for the War of Three Peaks content. Mm-hmm. Okay. All right, well, we went inside last time. Okay, now I'm going to look at the map. All right, so yeah, there were some other things to look at in the area here. But I think... Um, we had... Did I decide to head up towards the... towards Gundabad and then do Wormsgraf at the end? I believe you were talking about going to Wormsgraf and then swinging over. But okay. uh, it's really up to you which way you want to go. Well, that I think would be fairly... Um, uh, emphatically unsafe. But um, that's all right. Okay. All right, so inside we saw a whole bunch of long beard dwarves. Mm-hmm. Led by Prince Durin, the unnumbered as yet. Yes, Prince Durin, the unnumbered. I like that. Yes, the son yeah. of Thorin, the third Stonehill. That's a great name. Durin, the unnumbered, I mean. Um, okay, let's we don't know around. exactly when Durin the last... Uh, no, we don't. Thing. We don't. I okay, always so honestly thought it was like something toward the end of days or something. So there's another fortress on a hill over here. Why are they making all these separate fortresses? So we were opining that perhaps this was something like a, a kind of a gatehouse, like a sort of a, a guest entry point. But there's a bunch of them. Yeah. I'm still fascinated by the fact that you can't see Gundabad from here, because I can. Nope. No, I think I turned yeah. my resolution down at one point, because I was having some kinds of issues. Oh, look, I'm worried. It'll pop in soon enough when you get closer. Yeah. No, I still can't see it. Yeah. Not understanding the function. So, though... The whole um, kind of welcome zone concept that we were toying with last time um, does at least help me understand a little bit better, I think, than I did before. The um, uh, why they're building above ground. Because it seems to be actually focused on like greeting folks who are coming up along this way. And if, of course, the Aotheod was here then, when this was originally built, they would have had neighbors, right, with whom they would have been communicating and trafficking, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. There would have been trade. And the Longbeards were not the only uh, dwarves up this way. Right. In fact, it's very possible that a lot of the stuff wasn't built by them. Right. Well, that was my original theory. I, I think that, I do think that the Longbeards might be squatters, but okay. Let's, I mean, the current ones, the ones that are in there now. All right, let's head down. I don't need to jump down the cliff. Let's go by the road. Modestly less likely to get lost that way. The way that the very imposing and very obvious fortifications, not even fortifications, because they're like, um, you know, just arches and things, right? Like walkways. Yeah, flying that, buttresses all over the place. Right. And when I'm thinking along the edge of the cliff, right? I mean, they obviously mm -hmm. built those up so as to be visible from below. Right? It's like, mm -hmm. hey, look, the dwarves are here. We are your neighbors. Which can be both 
a warning and a friendly reminder, right? Like, hey, there's a dwarf kingdom right up here. So, like, keep in mind about everything that it means that there's a dwarf kingdom right up here. Both it means this is our kingdom and stay out if you're not friendly. But also, I mean, potentially something like open for business, you know. Um, well, you've got to... always live underground? I think so. Yeah, I think they need a reason to... Um, I think they need a reason to... Um, oh, hey, would you stop killing me? Super rude. I'm talking about things over here. Um, I, th I think they need a reason to be above ground. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, I also wish it weren't night. Can we get up there? Is that accessible? Uh, yeah, actually, if you cross the river over here. Seems to be a path up the hill. Gosh, it's hard to see. Hard to see the dark stone castle in the dark. I will give you a clue that this is the same sort of design as a place you haven't been to called Scarhold. Right, yeah. I, I, I've heard people mention that. That's the Iron Hills thing, right? Uh, no, that's uh, Yarnfast. Um so yarn pass is like the red stuff, and then Scarhold is where we get the the lapis lazuli, the really okay. awesome blue stuff. It's the same well, basic design here as Scarhold. And it looks like that other place in uh, Wells of Wangfoy. What was it called? Um, this one, Sundergrat. 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 Yeah. It, yeah, Sundergrat is like, basically the same sort yeah. of style. Yeah. Sakal Atra. Oh, look! There's even a door over here. Well, that's nice. Look at that. Yeah. And Greenstand looking like Hala the Door Ward up here. So we can go in. Yeah, oh, nice. I'm not careful. He'll wind up like Hala the Door Ward because there are bad guys inside. Oh, uh, yeah. This place is a wreck. So who's the. Oh, Angmarim up here? Mm hmm. Iron Crown folks? Hmm. Oh, that's interesting. I was looking for Angmarim relics, but this is, wasn't what I had in mind. Because I think, right, we've got the crystals, which are very dwarvish light source here. And these are clear squatters. Yeah. Yeah. Probably relatively recently come. They're all in the like quasi priestly garb of the Angmarim, the gray and reddish cowled robes and such. Yeah, so much of the Angmarim that we're used to seeing up in uh, Angmar. Mm hmm. Right, but not any of the like uh, Hillman look there. None of, the, of those. Yeah. The Trans Galore and their. Former distant kin. Okay. Yeah, I've not been seeing... in Angmar for the past three weeks or anything. <laughs> right. I'm not seeing much in the uh, architecture that is very different. We have some kind of rite going on. Rasmar Blood Rue? What is that about? A named person. Blood Rue? What does that even mean? They rue the blood? I don't know. Like, rue the day? I'm trying to figure out in what sense the word rue is being used. Well, this... Okay, it's kind of gross and bloody down here in the water. 
Yeah, and, and it's all, you know, red and evil looking down here. Though you can see the arch I mean the architecture is no different. It's just creepy red light. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I surmise this is actually water rather than blood because it doesn't have the viscosity of blood, but it still looks Agreed. kind of gross in a um, meant to evoke of blood, blood from with the yeah. lowlands kind of way. Yeah. 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 No, that's the other rue. thing that I was thinking. Yeah, rue is a. Um, it's a plant. That's the other thing that I was thinking of. Um, that's why it struck me that it was using rue not as a verb, but as a noun. Um, so not as a you will rue the day, but blood rue. Yeah. Um, could blood rue be an angmarim herb? Maybe. Huh. Okay, so I mean, okay, there's a, a named Angmarim doing something nasty down in the water. Architecturally speaking, we don't, I mean, this is much more ruinous than the other, of course, so we don't get to see as much. Hard to tell what this used to be, though notice the ceilings are so much lower all the way through from the entryway on. Right, so obviously not made for tourists. Exactly. It does not have the same kind of welcome hall sort of uh, feel to it that um, Ooh, you got the screenshot of going to bed on the way out. Oh man, I wasn't looking. I was looking over at the comments. Oh no! <laughs> I missed it. Um, oh, it looked actually pretty good. The nice loading screen. Oh well. Um... Let's go by the road. Let's go back around by the road. So this looks like what, like a, an outpost? It, much more functional with its hallways and floor plan. I mean, what of the floor plan we could still get to anyway. Looked much more functional. Oh, there we go. Now I got yeah. it. It looks so smooth. It kind of reminds me of the dower handy sort of look that we had seen in Ered Lewin. A little bit. That diamond thing they've got going on, it's a dominant motif. It's really interesting. Okay. Well, we'll get... How many spires are there? There's seven spires for seven fathers? I don't know. I'm still right at the edge. Some of it... I don't trust that all the spires were coming in for me, so I want to get a little closer here. The, uh, the lake is lovely. With the island in the middle. Oh, yeah. I think there were some spires I wasn't seeing. I want to come up to this vantage point up here. Okay. Oh, man. The spire's look is is very interesting. We've got look, I can even see the peaks behind it now. Yep. The three peaks. There are and six right. of these diamonds. Okay. Now Flanking on either side, we have these constructions that are straight out of Carn Doom. Mm -hmm. 
So those I've been looking. Um, I've been looking for Angmarim stuff, and there they are on either side. And yeah, it does look like we 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 get some scaffolding there, repairing some of those spires. You're right, very clearly. Or maybe desecrating them. <laughs> right. Let's erect a scaffold so as more conveniently to desecrate the spires. I suppose you'd have to. Yeah, JJ, I was looking at that too. We can see some evil Tudor houses down there. Yeah, we get the whole the whole thing. You get the stripey, you know, uh Wood you know, plaster. Well, right. Like the sort of evil quasi uh, you know, walls of Constantinople thing going on. Anyway. Whoa. I'm really struck by the smoothness of the walls, which look like they're plastered. Maybe they're smooth stone. But the smoothness of the stone and the windows this looks like I don't know what it looks like it doesn't look dwarven it doesn't look like a fortress it looks like well, all the windows make it yeah, look yeah. like um, make it look like a, a great palace. house like yeah like a palace like a like a sort of like a not exactly like a Georgian palace but yeah I agree Holger at least the at least the sun is rising so we're getting some daylight on the equation here um yeah and the color the light like beiges going on here and the spires I don't remember seeing anything like those spires just spires for the sake of it you know I don't recall seeing Dwarven architecture being so elegant and not complicated. Like, busy. Like, you look at the, the, the ruins in the foreground, the, the ruins behind us, and there's all kinds of little, you know, fripperies going on here. Even though it's all a, a nice, elegant shape and design, there's no... Yeah, like, look at the gold no inlay and everything. Yeah, line. yeah. Yeah. But this is a much more basic... Honestly, it kind of reminds me of... Uh, the designs of Mos Eisley on Tatooine, you know, the, the hmm. whole adobe structure out in the desert. You right. Know the deal. Right. Right. No, I think I see what you mean by that. Um, and I find myself just surprised by the diamonds. I don't know why. But the, the, the dominance of that visual motif in the center of all of those Maybe they are marble walls, Cronus. That seems likely. Of course, close up, we can see now. You can see the blocks now. It's not just smooth plaster. Yeah. yeah. Maybe it I is marble. Well. Yeah. Um, I don't recall dwarves using white and beige. Like the earth tone, we've generally seen the darker and the richer colors. Gray, yes. browns, gold. This is like I don't know, Mediterranean. During huh. an uh, Italian villa or something without the red slate roof. Really interesting. <laughs> yeah, our, uh -oh. our lovely friends are experiencing the joys of going to high areas. Yes, yes, yes getting murdered by the fauna. Yeah, like the girls in the earth getting murdered by moose one year. By the moose, yeah, that was a that was mm -hmm. one of my favorite Twitch moments ever. Um, it had and, to be permanently archived. Oh yeah, no, that was that was wonderful, and um, uh, one like my memorable experience when that doe chased me down the tunnel all the way into <laughs> Hennethan. Yes, Noon. I remember. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was that was delightful. Um, Oh, the dread killed you when you just stepped into the area, Cronith? Hmm. 
Yeah, when when you're a low level character and you die in a zone uh, where the name under the mini map is is red, is red. You'll get yeah. Set, you'll get sent back to your milestone. Oh, JJ, look at that. Interesting. Right, JJ. Yeah, is, that's uh, definitely that the same vibe. Yeah. Yeah. Looking at uh, just it. Well going to be challenging for me to bring it over because I'm in full screen mode. Um, I got you, fam. There you go. Um, I posted it to a chat for folks to check out. So okay. yeah, that was the Potatalo. Potalo? I quite frankly read it as potato because um, right. potatoes. Cool. But daylight came just in time for us to see it. It sure did. But the diamonds are interesting to me because they're not entwined with something else. Like, the shape of something in other architecture we've seen is the the shape of the overall section would be a diamond, and you have designs within the diamond shape. This is like the diamond is an applique onto some, like, in this plain facade. So yes, it's exactly. Not, it's, it's, it's the not part of it. Yes, it's the starkness of just that one shape superimposed on the like white, perhaps marble background, mm -hmm. um, instead of being worked into. So, like, come in. Let's. Can we? Can we? Yeah. It's not gonna hurt too much. Okay. Um, yeah. So we do have some hostels here. I'm uh, working oh, yeah. my way over towards uh, this. This other dwarvish building in the foreground, basically. I'm gonna do a little comparison and contrast. Here to Zudramandan. Zudramdan. All right, so if we. All right. Never mind. Okay. Right. So. Lots of shapes, right? Lots of different kinds of shapes. Oh, is the stable master here? Oh, we made it to my first stable master. Hey, that was the goal. Didn't even know I was there. Anyway, but my point is, not it's not just when you look at how much busier this is, right? Mm -hmm. Even the smooth face surprised me because you don't you we don't usually see that. We often see this, right? Like the the layers of rock seems to be it's like one of the design elements, right? Right, yeah. You yeah. know, the, the, the dominant horizontal lines of the of the blocks. And then you've got the vertical the vertical lines with the gold filigree and the other gold mm -hmm. uh, you know, inlay lines crossing it over. And you've got the shapes worked on top of that, right? The rings, but then you've also got the hexagons, right? The prolonged hexagons there with the rings inside and then the not work inside that. Um, yeah, definitely busy and shapes over shapes over shapes. And this is like big honking wall with just one tiny little itty bitty shape like a blueberry. Right. And the only thing that they have just like everything has been worked into the architecture. Right. Like the like, yes, you've got the filigree work on those, you know, like pilasters coming down the side of the but they're part of the structure. Right. The it's shapes not are just the architecture. like, yeah, it's not just like glued on. The only thing that's glued on here are these long hexagonal shapes, potentially. Right. Those mm -hmm. are sort of extra, but they're not. I don't understand. It's them. still gold on dark bluish black, the same as the background. Right. It's not like we're just taking an outside thing and, you know, nailing it on. It just. I just have not, and whereas with the other more uh, um, long beardy, um, uh, uh, no, that wasn't it. Long, long beardish. What was our adjective? We had dower handy. Oh, I think, 
and um, long beardish. Well, it wasn't long beardian. I don't think so. I think it was long beardish. Anyway, mm-hmm. long beardian. It was long beardian. Okay. Um, so, in the more long beardian architecture, like there in Arid Luin that we were looking at for so long, it tended to be cleaner, much less busy than this. It tended to be cleaner. But like, and uh, geometric shapes, but the geometric shapes were built into like a, a really prominent, you know, pentagonal keystone or diamond mm-hmm. keystone or something like that, right? Um, the, uh, the, the sort of hex arches and that kind of thing. Um, but um, there also seems to be two separate styles going on here. I mean, the primary building structures are basically this dark gray with the gold overlay, but along here are these, these little plinths that are this basically the scar hall design, which have like the, the lapis lazuli and are more blue and gold rather than um, just the gray and gold. You see them? Where? Um, they're generally the plinths along the border, like where JJ and I are bouncing. And okay, everybody. over here? Yeah, these things. Like this one. It's more of a blue and deep blue and the actual color of the stone. Oh right, with has the with the purple and stuff in the middle. Yeah, yeah. 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 Oh. It's funny because it I was going to say Right, I was going to say I do think that the walls of this keep here are bluish. But they're not as blue as this, I agree. It kind of looks like the, um, you know, these little pods, pillars. Not even sure exactly what they are, I guess. Um, We're kind of placed here. It's, uh, It's almost like they took the bluest of the rock and made it into these, whereas like the slightly more grayish, purplish less purely colorful one was used for the walls. It could be a simple case where the blue uh, rock was more plentiful to the east, which is where Scarhold is. And Maybe. so this is where like the veins and stuff taper off. So they didn't have as much to build their primary structures out of it. Hmm. Well, there's obviously much more to see here. But Lots of friends up there, too. Yeah, I figured. But I achieved my goal of getting to the next stable master. Anyway, is there a milestone here, too? I don't honestly recall. If there is, it might be inside. I don't see one on the mini-map. Yeah, it looks like there's a uh, legendary items dude in there and a mailbox apparently yeah this is more of your outposty kind of thing so there really isn't anybody yeah. here yeah no I don't see a... yeah I would expect it if there were to be one to be outside yeah, I do like this too. crystal in the middle I mean that's a new design yeah coming out of a star Huh. Anyway, okay. Well, we will explore here a little bit more thoroughly next time. I just wanted to see if there was a milestone before we left. Um, okay. Well, that's fine. We'll keep. Uh, we we can keep. We can stable up to here from the last place, so we can at mm-hmm. least get here through stables. So, all right. Oh, I think we should say goodnight it's getting late here thank you everybody for joining me fun first glimpse of gundabad here and we'll come back and look more and see what we can figure out of a with a more detailed survey next time awesome thank you guys very much and i will see you guys next week bye now bye